From almost failing high school to not going to college, spending way too much money on alcohol, chasing way too many women, and playing way too many video games, my 20s were not one of success. At least up until 25 to 27 years old, when I began to rewrite my life, think about what I wanted, and driving towards my ambitions and goals. I quit my career of 12 years to start a YouTube channel and a business. I ended up making $10,000 my first time at 28 years old. By the time I turned 30, I made $20,000, but I've also found myself homeless and sleeping on couches. Help me, I'm poor. No. I've owned a property and I've lost a property. I've made a lot of mistakes when it comes to entrepreneurship and wealth. And even though, through my 20s, I tripled or quadrupled my income, no matter how much money I would make, it always seemed to disappear. And that's because while I understood how to make money, I didn't understand the philosophy of money or the philosophy of wealth. And yes, there is a philosophy to wealth. And if you don't understand it, you're gonna struggle and make a lot of mistakes like I did. So if you're watching this and you're 20 to 30 years old, I have a lot of information and value to give you through this video that I wish I would have known when I was 20 years old when it comes to building and maintaining your wealth. All right, let's jump into the video. So the first thing you need to know about building wealth is there's two sides to the coin. There's the cash flow side of the coin, and then there's the investing side. Both are equally important. You must develop both simultaneously, and if you fail at one, you will fail at both of them and stay exactly where you're at. So what's the difference between cash flowing and investing? Well, one of my favorite quotes is from a brilliant psychologist called Carl Jung, and he said that if you fix the problem of the individual, you will fix the problem of society. Now in entrepreneurship, if you fix your problem, that means you can also fix others and charge them money for it. Here's a really important belief that you need to adopt. Your wealth will be a reflection of the value you bring to society. And cash flow is a measurement of the value that you bring. The more people that you help in this world, and the harder the problems is that you solve, the more cash flow you will have. Now, some people are really great at building cash flow but they fail at the other side of the coin, which is investing. A lot of people actually get trapped in a high cash flow profession, and they never learn the investing side of the coin because they get comfortable because they're making a lot of money. You see this a lot in high income earners with W-2s, doctors, lawyers, high paying professions. A lot of times these people can generate tremendous cash flow because they're providing an essential service to society, but they never actually attain monumental wealth. So what is investing? Well, you might think it's compounding interest. You might think it's developing your Yourself. You might think it's starting a business, and it is all of those things, but it, those are all also wrong. Investing is the art of cash flow preservation. Very subtle but important definition. It is the preservation of wealth, not the generation of wealth. It is measuring risk and having a strategic plan to avoid that risk. For example, inflation is a risk and there's ways to strategize around that. Compounding interest is a symptom of investing, but compounding interest by itself is not investing. Investing is actually a deeper psychological belief. There's also a deep psychological and emotional aspect to investing that a lot of people never address and never work on, myself included. Someone who does not respect themselves will give their time and energy away freely and to anyone. They will also not respect their wealth or invest it wisely. They will spend money on alcohol, drugs, and partying to mask their lack of fulfillment in their life. They'll buy a Mercedes they can't really afford to impress people that don't really care about them. And they'll never seek out a deeper understanding of themselves to correct their ego and lack of self-respect, which is why they stay poor even if they're making $200,000 a year. As the saying goes, a fool and his money will soon part. We'll discuss a lot the emotional side of money and the importance of self-respect in, in achieving financial independence. Your internal identity and standards that you hold yourself by will dictate your wealth, not your knowledge or skill at cash flow. Society will often neglect these aspects of wealth because they're hard to teach, but it's actually crucial to learn them and develop them if you wanna break from the matrix. Again, if you only solve one side of the coin, you're going to be broke forever. Or at best, just living at the edge of your knowledge and skill, like having a high paying professional job. Continuous wealth building comes from mastery of cash flow and investing, as well as mastering yourself. You will not become wealthy if you do not provide society with value. You will also not become wealthy if you do not respect yourself in preserving the wealth that you have created. You will also not become wealthy if you do not become aware of your ego. So how do you increase your cash flow and how do you preserve it? Did you know that there's four types of money? They go in this order. Time trading, passive, compounding, and replication. 
And depending on which ones you choose to generate your wealth, you will either be poor or rich for the rest of your life. Let's start with the most obvious one and the one that the majority of the world is in. And the majority of people are broke because they make their money trading their time. Most advice you'll get from society and family will tell you to trade your time, AKA get a better job, get a better career, get a better W-2. All the people that tell you that advice are usually broke, living paycheck to paycheck and severely struggling behind closed doors. And they're also the most heavily taxed and the largest demographic the government makes their money off of. Time cost can also be called opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is the price of the road not taken, where every choice is a trade-off. When it comes to the four types of money, whichever form you select, the cost is the time spent not making money on the other forms of money. If I spend 40 hours a week time trading, that's 40 hours a week I can't spend on the other three types of money. So let's talk about passive and compounding money. Earlier I said most YouTubers will not teach you ways to be wealthy because it's hard to sell something that's difficult. They'll sell what's easiest to sell to you so that they make the most money off of their books and videos. And the type of money that you'll be sold the most is passive and compounding money. Here's an example of passive and compounding money while cutting trees. See, if I wanted to make this easier, I could take my knife and carve out a ring around this tree. It's called girdling or ringing a tree. What happens is it kills the tree. And if I just wait six months to a year, this tree will rot out and die and be much easier to cut down and pull out. Now, everyone knows investing in the stock market is a great way to compound your wealth. If you want to pinch pennies for the first 30 years of your life and finally have some money left over when you're in your 60s. See, the average rate of compounding in the stock market is 8%, which means it takes about nine years for your money to double. In the course of your lifetime, it will only double four to six times if you traditionally invest. Personally, I want to live my best life every day and not wait 30 years for it. Now you might be saying, but Garrett, you teach the stock market. You've been teaching it for six years. Yes, but I don't teach it as a cash flow side of the money coin. I teach it as a way to invest and park your money into something that's relatively simple for young people until you learn the better and more advanced forms of the money coin. I actually teach the most advanced form of stock market investing, which is algorithmic design. I'll be making a video on this specifically, but I have machines that automatically invest for me that make 30 to 100% a year returns. It's just a place to park money on the investing side of the coin. The problem with passive and compounding money isn't that it doesn't work. The underlying principles are true. The problem with passive and compounding money is they don't solve the cash flow side of the money coin. Like I said, you have to solve both sides of the money coin if you want to be wealthy. You can't just do one. Passive and compounding money also does not solve the time issue we faced in time trading. See, if I was to come out here and cut rings around all of the trees in this woods and then wait some months to cut them down, it would be more efficient and it would be more passive and compounding per unit of work, but I'd still have to be coming out here and working. I'm still trading my time in order to cut down the trees. And the more trees that I ring, the more workload I have. Owning and buying more and more real estate increases your time management and handling a large investment portfolio requires more time and handling of that portfolio. And as it gets bigger, the risk also increases. In fact, in the stock market and real estate, there is a direct correlation to the time you spend managing your portfolio and the amount of returns that you make. Again, it's not that it doesn't work, it's just not the most efficient for the cash flow side of the coin. If you put one hour of work into your investing portfolios, you're gonna have subpar returns. If you put 40 hours a week or more into your portfolio, you'll have better returns, but then you're back to time trading. It's just a better form of time trading. The more your portfolios grow, the more emotional stress and time management you'll take. There's also an unseen killer of passive and compounding money that no one ever really talks about. And it's called profit arbitrage. Most forms of passive and compounding wealth, like buying real estate or investing in the stock market, doing storage rental companies, storage space, equipment rentals, 
car rentals, all of those things are very easy. Buying property is basically one of the most streamlined processes in America. You literally don't need to do anything. Just find a real estate agent and they will pretty much do all the work for you. All you have to do is sign some paper. Because the barrier of entry for real estate is so low and so is the stock market, the market is saturated and therefore the profit is eaten away. And you will always see this race to the bottom and profit arbitrage in the majority of passive and compounding incomes. And as the barrier for entry drops, the competition and market saturation increases. 20 years ago, real estate investing or being a real estate broker was not a super common thing. I mean, it was popular, but it wasn't popular like it is now. The barrier to entry in real estate investing or stock market investing has dropped significantly over the past 20 years. And with that drop, so does the profit margins. A much more common business model that is easily seen in the past five years is Amazon fulfillment and Shopify dropshipping. Five to 10 years ago, those business models were insanely profitable, like really profitable. Today though, the barrier of entry is so low that anyone can do it, that there's so many people doing it so the profits are not nearly as good as they were and they will continue to drop until we reach the bottom of profit margins where you're basically fighting for pennies. So if you're considering developing your wealth off a of passive or compounding philosophy, you better think long and hard about the market and what it's gonna be like five to 10 years from now. If the barrier for entries drop in your market, competition will increase and your profit margins will disappear. Anytime you hear someone peddling passive income on YouTube or some course, just know that's true for a little bit. Now there are tactical ways to combat this stuff in business called branding and customer loyalty, but you have to be strategic about it and you have to learn a bit more. Like I said, going into this video, I'm probably gonna give you advice that you won't agree with or like, and your parents definitely won't like it. But the best way to develop wealth is actually the hardest way to develop wealth. But because it's the hardest, you'll never see anyone teaching you it or selling it to you because it's hard and it's hard to sell things that are hard to do. People like simple, easy, that's what sells. And you might be wondering why I'm selling the hard road in this video. Well, it's because I believe you are the five people closest to you and your network is your net worth. And I personally would like to surround myself with men who choose the hardest way. In fact, I think David Goggins actually said this the best. I like to get a bunch of men together. Okay. Men mm -hmm. that are the hardest of the hard. Mm -hmm. And I wanna be with these men. I'm sorry, I had to put that in this video. Earlier, I said your wealth is a reflection of the value you bring to society. If you solve one of your problems, you can also solve that problem for other people and then charge them for it. This is the philosophy of building businesses. There's a lot you need to know about building a successful business and there's a lot of experience and knowledge gap which is required for replication. But replication is the hardest and the best way and the fastest way to build your wealth. For example, instead of cutting these trees myself, I could call one of my friends or hire someone to do it. Hello. Hey bro, I got a tree to cut. You wanna do it for hundred bucks? Now, if I call someone to pay them to do it, all I have to do to basically free up my time is sell this wood for more than it costs to pay some. Or better, I could go to other people's houses and see if they have trees and wood that needs to be cut down and then just hire the workers to do it. I take a small percentage and the only time cost to me was talking to the customer instead of cutting my own wood. See, Henry Ford was a replicator. The average car today has 30 to 40,000 pieces for its assembly. The first car ever mass produced, the Ford Model T, had 10,000 parts. Before Henry Ford, cars were built by a single craftsman. Imagine one man building a car or an entire house alone. That's how cars were built. Henry Ford took all 10,000 pieces of a car, broke it down, and taught a thousand men how to put on a nut, how to put on a wheel, how to stamp the frame out. He built the first assembly line. He took a process of building cars from one man and replicated that man 10,000 times. Steve Jobs and Bill Gates are replicators. I don't know about you, but if you ever looked into a computer, they're pretty complex. Elon Musk is a replicator. Jeff Bezos is a replicator. Every man on this planet who is a billionaire is a replicator. Replication is also the most tax advantaged form of money. The government loves replicators because replicators create time traders and time traders are the most heavily taxed people where the government makes all of their money. So, how do you become a replicator? Now, fortunately, while it's hard to become a replicator, it's not terribly complex. Most people just don't have the attention span and the dedication to learn what they need to learn to become a replicator. So 
society also doesn't train them to be a replicator. You'll also probably have limiting beliefs trained into you by your friends, society, and family. Concepts like business people are evil. Money is the root of all evil. And if you desire wealth, something is wrong with you. <laughs> people that speak like that, typically projecting or just blindly regurgitating what they were taught by their family and their parents. The beliefs aren't actually conscious beliefs, rather an inherited one. Another reason that people aren't wealthy is because they don't actually desire to provide value to society, which would raise their wealth. They would rather be selfish and spend their time with themselves rather than helping other people. It's more fun to sit around and watch Netflix than it is to seek someone else's problems and then try to solve them for them. If you wanna be a replicator, the first thing you have to do is develop empathy and actually care about people. There is actually a huge aspect in business when it comes to ethics and being a good man. My grandfather built a business out of his chicken coop in 1947. Today, that business is a multi-million dollar manufacturing facility that I was supposed to inherit, but after 12 years of working there, I turned in my two weeks to start a YouTube channel. Through the 12 years, though, that I worked with my family, I actually got 100 plus years of knowledge from experience from my family. My uncle was a business owner and a replicator. My grandmother was a business owner and a replicator. My aunt is also a business owner and a replicator. And I've learned a lot about replication and business ethics through those 12 years. But you cannot be a replicator if you do not develop empathy and caring about other people and their problems. The first step is desiring to help society. You have to have a passion for caring about other people. It's very taxing and it can be very frustrating at times. But this is where most people fail and this is why the majority of people are not replicators. It's human nature to only wanna focus on yourself and what you want. Most people only wanna work the minimum hours they need to work to live their life. They don't work to help people, they work to get a paycheck so that they can go do what they want. That's why they're broke. It's probably why you're broke. You don't desire to put in your best effort or do the best work that you can, which would give the best service to those you serve, because you really don't care that much. You'd rather go do what you want to do and go have fun. And that's perfectly okay. I'm definitely not one to judge. When I, this is me at 18 years old, I did not give a damn about anybody's problems. And there's a lot of things I did in my career for 12 years that I really just didn't care about. But if you want to be wealthy, you have to care about people and the problems, which requires empathy. So after you learn how to develop your empathy and caring about people and their problems, then you have to figure out how to build a system to deliver your solution to those people. Then you have to figure out what you're passionate about. And in my experience, you're gonna be most passionate about helping people with the problems that you used to face. In fact, my entire YouTube channel is essentially me having problems and then fixing them and then making a video about it. It's your story and your experience that you went through that gives people the emotional connection to help them and their problem. After all, you can't help somebody with a problem that you've never faced. The third most difficult thing about replication is everyone will tell you you're insane. People don't like people who reflect a different life choice than the road that they chose. If your father was in the military and his father was in the military and his father was in the military, or if every sibling and uncle you've ever worked with works in medical and you tell them that you want nothing to do with the family legacy, trust me, they're not gonna understand. When you try to become a replicator and pave your own way, you will be doing so alone for a very long time. You will sacrifice a lot. You will naturally start to distance yourself from those you used to be close to. You'll stop doing the hobbies that you used to do. You will suffer from loneliness and isolation and you will doubt yourself the entire way. You will fail over and over and over, trust me, because you're doing something that was never taught to you. And the majority of people cannot relate to it. That's why so many people don't do it. If you do decide to become a replicator though, there's a few tips I can give you that'll make it a lot easier. Now the number one thing I wish I would have known when I was 20 years old is the importance of self-awareness. A lack of self-awareness will destroy every attempt at generating wealth. I've been consciously developing my self-awareness for about five years. Meditation, journaling, and self-reflection is the best ways to develop self-awareness. I'm gonna be making a video soon called Breaking Out of the Matrix, which will be heavily focused on developing self-awareness. But that's a video for a different day. An interesting thing I learned about money, though, and self-awareness is this. We often spend money the way we eat. 
The first time I heard this, I thought it was stupid as hell. But over a few months, I started noticing and watching my money habits and relating it to how I, I ate. One weekend, I binged a bunch of food and fell off the wagon with my fitness. I then noticed I would be extremely disciplined and strict with my money for a while, and then all of a sudden go binge it on a vacation or spend all my money. And I said, holy shit, I do spend my money like I eat. I was talking to a girl recently who told me that she would wake up in the middle of the night and binge eat food. I then asked her, do you spend a lot of time shopping at night too? She's like, yeah, I spend, I buy a lot of stuff on Amazon past 12 o'clock. I'm like, yep. <laughs> I started diving more and more into the philosophy and science behind this idea, and I found that parts of our brain that activate with money also activate with food because it's a medium of exchange for acquiring food, and food is one of our critical resources for survival. So if you want to be wealthy, you need to become aware of where you spend your money and your energy that's going out, which brings us to the next concept about money, which is money is just energy. Well, to be specific, it's a conduit of energy. Oh, shit. I can figure out the stock market, but I can't figure out how to not break my cameras. You see this crack right here? I don't know if you can tell, but this tree fell and it's bent up on this tree. And I think there's tension right here. So if you ever cut trees or cut metal or anything and you have something under tension, be very careful with how you cut it because it might snap and hit you in the face. So I'm gonna relieve this. Now, if you get really deep into the philosophy of money, you'll find that money is often talked about as if it's water or energy. Here's a great way to conceptualize wealth and money. I want you to imagine that every business, every nation, every person is a pond or a lake, and there are streams and rivers connecting to all of them. Money or water flows between these reservoirs. Money is just a conduit. It's, it's just a medium of exchange. You go to work and convert your time and your energy to money. Money will flow in exchange between individuals, businesses, and nations. So, if you want to develop your wealth, you need to find the biggest lake with the largest rivers, and then provide some kind of value to that lake. And as you do, your pond will grow. But just like the doctor and the lawyer who might spend all his money, you need to become aware of your outflow of your energy and your money. You have to respect yourself, and more importantly, respect the future version of you enough to not spend all your money or your energy, or else your pond will shrink. The only way to prevent your pond from shrinking is developing awareness. You need to be aware of your energy, aware of your outflow and where it's going. That's why self-awareness is tip number one. And the next lesson is developing self-respect so you don't spend all of your money and your energy. Now, one of the best ways I found of developing self-respect is deletion. What is deletion? You ever notice that most self-help and self-improvement stuff marginally or no net results on improving your life? How many books have you read and videos have you watched that have actually increased the quality of your life? or your wealth. It's not that the advice doesn't work, it's because it trains you to be a consumer. Your entire life, you've trained or been trained by this economy that we live in to be a consumer. America is a consumer economy. As a kid, you were trained by ads to talk to your parents into buying the hottest toy or the next new video game. You consume entertainment from Netflix, which makes shareholders rich. You consume brands and clothings to fit in with people that you're never, honestly, gonna ever see again. Trust me, if you're in your early 20s, you're not gonna know any of the people in your 30s. You consume porn and OnlyFans, which consumes your libido, your most powerful energy by far, and your libido makes women rich not to mention women that you'll probably never meet or date. Then when you go to college, you consume textbooks, you consume food from your cafeteria, you consume credit cards, debt, alcohol, and drugs. Literally from the moment that you have touched your first TV or screen, you have been consuming and being trained to be a consumer in a consumer economy. This is The Matrix at its rawest form. In fact, some of the most brilliant movies ever made, The Matrix, Fight Club, The Truman Show, I'm sure there's a lot more, all revolve around the concept of us consuming. But if you want to develop wealth, you need to have self-respect. And to develop self-respect, you must become aware of your consumption. Look at every broke person you know and watch how they spend their money. Watch how they complain about their money. You'll notice that they'll be completely oblivious to their consumption. And if you ask them why they're broke or why they don't have money, they will have 
all kinds of brilliant, elaborate excuses as to why they're broke. All of it will be bullshit and excuses because the root cause of why they're broke is they lack self-awareness and they lack an understanding of their energy coming in and out. And the best part is, guess who becomes wealthy from the consumers? The replicators. So instead of developing behaviors of consumption, you need to develop behaviors of replication. Start caring about other people more than you care about yourself. You see how that snapped back? There was tension on that. Start practicing awareness and meditation. Become aware of every hobby, every person, every thought or belief that you have. Then start deleting them, removing them one by one and attempting to downsize or reduce it to a bare minimum. Deletion is the hardest thing about self-improvement. Most people get into self-help and self-development, but all they do is consume inside of that industry. Gotta buy the next book, buy, gotta buy the next course, gotta go to this seminar. That's what everyone else did, right? You think Steve Jobs bought every book and went to every seminar that was thrown in his face in the decades that he built Apple? If this concept is new to you, it's because it's a very hard concept to teach. And because it's hard to teach, it's hard to sell. But why is it hard? Well, have you ever tried to delete every person you follow on IG? Ever tried to stop playing video games for after you've been playing them for a decade or two? Ever removed your entire social circle from your life? Ever discarded everything you've owned to live a life of minimalism? Ever sat in a room alone with yourself with nothing but a pencil and a notebook for an entire day? Deletion is the hardest thing to do because your ego attaches itself to everything you own. Your ego believes it is your thoughts. Your ego believes it is your friends group. It believes it is the things that you own. Literally everything in your life, your ego thinks that it is. Your mind, or more precisely, your subconscious mind, has an identity. And your subconscious mind and identity believes that it is all of those things. There's a great quote that I love to explain this. You're not what you own, but you will be owned by everything you own. You really are a product of your environment and the matrix you were born into. Don't believe me? Try to delete everything in your life right now. Remove all your friends, all the stuff you own, every single hobby that you have, delete all of your social medias. Seriously, pull out your phone. Right now, if you're watching this on your phone, drop out, hover over your Instagram and try to delete it. Or go to your Instagram followers and delete every single person that you follow. Watch how you feel, watch your thoughts, watch what happens to your body. You probably can't do it. Try stop watching YouTube and Netflix and Hulu. Get the hell off YouTube and stop watching these videos and do something with your life. Change your entire diet around, then sit in a room alone for a week with yourself in a pencil and a notebook. Literally try to remove everything you can from your current life and watch what happened. You will implode. Your body will physiologically react to the chaos. You'll probably have a manic episode or fall into a depression. Did I mention that this is hard? But this process of deletion is probably the most important part about self-development. While everyone else is developing behaviors of consumption, you must develop behaviors of deletion, minimalism, frugality, discipline, you must accept difficulty and you must accept loneliness. You must accept pain. That is the only way to grow and change. When we're alone with ourselves, we learn the most about who we are. And once you learn who you really are, then you can change who you really are. Deletion is painful. It's difficult. Your ego will fight you every step of the way. It is also why no one will try to sell it to you because it's really hard and painful. Let me give you a process I do though that helps out a lot when it comes to deletion. It's a visualization technique that I've been doing for almost a decade. You can also do it journaling. In fact, it probably works better as a journal. I want you to ask yourself, what type of people do you want in your life three years from now? What type of traits do these people have? How is their integrity and their character? How is their passion for the life that they have? How powerful is their love and their compassion for those around them? How do they treat others? Then ask yourself, who do I need to become to attract those people. I'm a firm believer that the universe gives you exactly what you deserve. And if you don't have those people in your life, it's because you haven't earned them. But you need to ask yourself, what do I need to do? What do I need to delete and remove or change within myself to become that version of who I wanna be? And I can tell you, it will not come from consumption. It will come from deletion. Repeat that visualization for the rest of your life and it will change the rest of your life. I started this process the day my grandfather died. 
because hundreds of people showed up to his funeral when I was 18 years old, and I sat in calling hours for four hours listening to stories of how amazing my grandfather was and all of the things he did. People literally shared with me the love that they had for a man that I just knew as my grandpa. After that day, I sat and I thought and asked these questions. Who did my grandpa become? What traits did he have to embody? How do you attain a life like that? And after 14 years now, I can tell you, he developed empathy and compassion for other people. He cared about their problems and he helped them. But the only way that you can change in who you wanna be is by deleting who you used to be. There are some nights I literally meditate by a fire alone, just to ingrain these desires in my mind and seek clarity on what I need to do to change. Back to the belief that the universe gives you exactly what you need. With that belief though, also comes the idea that the universe will take away everything that you are not worthy of. You see this concept the most with lottery winners. You probably now understand why lottery winners rarely ever become wealthy. If you didn't know, 98% of lottery winners usually end up broke. It's because they haven't put in the work to understand these concepts and philosophies of money. They don't care about other people or try to provide value to society. They take their winnings and they selfishly spend it on themselves. They also don't know themselves. They don't understand or manage their outflows of energy. They've never truly been alone with themselves or tried to delete their old identity. Most lottery winners aren't capable of taking their new wealth and generating more wealth and cash flow from it. And they usually don't respect themselves or lack the self-awareness to preserve their wealth. Even if somebody wins $100 million, they are not wealthy because external wealth comes from becoming internally wealthy. If you are not worthy of the external wealth you have, the universe will take it away from you. As the saying goes, a fool in his money will soon part. The philosophy of money and wealth is truly a brutal philosophy. Wealth is a zero sum game. You either figure it out or you don't. That is why it's so hard to be wealthy. And that is why no one will teach you these things. There's a tree in the way of me getting my tree. I don't know if you can see it, but the tree I'm cutting is right here. So, your wealth will mostly come from your personality. There's a test you can go do at understandmyself.com, which is a test on the big five personality factors, which has been around for about 40 years. And the website is actually ran by Jordan Peterson, if you know who he is. That assessment probably taught me more about myself than 10 years of self-development. The big five factor can be broken down into five factors. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. The two most important traits to success is openness to experience is number one, Number two is conscientiousness. The subsets of conscientiousness are organization and industriousness. If you wanna be more successful, go take that test, see where you fall in the personality spectrum. You either need to increase your openness or increase your conscientiousness. I'm 96 percentile open, so I don't have an issue there. In fact, uh, my issues are I'm too open. I have ADHD and I say yes to way too many things. So I actually had to learn to say no to more things. That's the, uh, back to the idea of outflow of energy. And I was low in organization, which I needed to work on over the past couple of years. Now, when you go take that test, you will find out a lot about yourself. In my early 20s, I thought I was introverted because my life and my environment, the matrix, made me introverted. But I found out through my personality assessment that I'm actually extremely extroverted. Go figure, you know, I make YouTube videos for a living and I do marketing and sales. I didn't know this 10 years ago, but my life was miserable and I was depressed. My energy was all out of whack and I was throwing my money away, my energy away on random stupid stuff because I was miserable. Like I said, self-awareness and understanding who you are is the most important thing when it comes to developing wealth. Now, when you take the personality assessment, you will find you're either extroverted or not extroverted. You will be compassionate or you will not be compassionate. If you're low in compassion and high in extroversion, you'll be great at sales. If you're higher in compassion and higher extroverted, you'll be better at recruitment of people and working with people around sales. If you're lower in extroversion, you'll be better at management. You'll be better at systems and you know coding and machinery and stuff like that. If you're high in openness, you'll be interested in art and science and philosophy and technology. If you're lower in openness, you need to increase your openness. But the point I'm trying to make here is that your cash flow side of your wealth, of the money coin, will come from your personality. My wealth, my cash flow comes from making YouTube videos. It comes from talking to people and networking, doing sales and marketing. I have found what works best for me based on my personality. And your personality is heavily genetic. It is actually connected to your endocrine system. For example, openness is connected to dopamine. Extroversion is connected to uh, serotonin and cortisol and your ability to dissipate cortisol. In fact, people that 
that are low in extroversion, genetically, biochemically, their body can't process serotonin and cortisol as efficiently as someone who is higher in extroversion. That is why they're able to sustain themselves in social situations for a longer period of time. Again, it all comes down to understanding yourself better, self-awareness. If you haven't seen Amani Ghazi's video yet on how to become wealthy in your 20s, I highly recommend you go watch it. But his second lesson in that video is don't start with a product, start with a service. And as somebody who worked in manufacturing for 12 years, I cannot tell you how many stories I saw of people coming in to our facility, having the next greatest product and idea that needs to be mass produced, but these people knew nothing about sales and marketing and channeling and systems of operations and finance. They, they had absolutely no experience on how to run a business, yet they were trying to start with a product. I 100% also agree with Imani on do not start with a product. You should start with a service and serve someone else until you gain the experience to develop a product of your own. Now in his video, he recommends starting with a service you can charge for $1,000 or more and it be reoccurring for month over month. And I also highly recommend that. I did sales for about two years and the type of sales I was doing was constantly going out and hunting leads and doing cold calls. And it's just exhausting to do single point sales. If you want to develop wealth, you need reoccurring revenue every month. You should automatically eliminate any potential opportunities if they do not provide reoccurring revenue and scaling revenue off of that. Now, if you watch Amani's video, he's selling a course and a community where he teaches you how to replicate what he was doing. Amani literally is a modern day replicator. From everything I gathered from studying his course, he teaches you freelance arbitrage. And if you don't know what that is, it's where you play the middleman to find clients and connect them with freelance workers overseas. Now, I currently ran some analytics on his video, which currently has 1.3 million views. And I'm assuming he has a positive customer of acquisition running his revenue for his ads to scale his videos. And he's selling his community and coaching for $1,500. The entire funnel is beautiful and very well built. And it probably has a decent conversion rate. So even with a 1% conversion, which is low for the quality that I think his funnel is, that $1,500 product is probably sold 13,000 times. And that estimates his revenue on the low end to be about $15 million. And I know from watching his videos, he's currently estimated to be around $85 million net worth at 22 years old or 23 years old. I also know that the average profit margin for an online education business is around 85%. So on the extreme low end, his profit is a minimum of 10 to $12 million, which shows a great example of replication and the power of it. Freelance arbitrage services is a great business model. And it's been around since the industrial revolution and it is an extremely profitable business model for a period. But as I've stated, and this is something that Amani really didn't disclose in his video, is that it runs the same risk of all arbitrages. There will eventually be hyper competition and an oversaturation in the market, but it might be five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you just really don't know. My family's business, which is in manufacturing, made a ton of money in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. But as time went on, competition increased and profit margins decreased. It runs into the same risk as Alibaba dropshipping. Five years ago, it was extremely profitable to do a dropshipping business, but now, everybody's doing it and the profit margins are abysmal. I'm not saying his course is bad. In fact, the more I watch his stuff, I think I might pick it up. But you should just be aware that anything that has to do with arbitrage, profits will continue to decrease with time. So if you wanna get into it, the best time is actually now. And this is not a promotion or an affiliate. I have never talked to Amani. I have no affiliate with him. I'm just being transparent with you on my experience and knowledge from my business practices. What this means for you though, is you should plan for an exit strategy. If you build a business and you don't have an exit strategy, you haven't really built a business. You've built an anchor. Now, common ways of exit strategies is obviously selling the business, branding it so that it becomes the top of its competition or acquisitioning all of your competition and buying up all of their books of business so that you essentially become the dominant force in that industry. Or you diversify your wealth outside of that market into more stable, long-lasting wealth vehicles like real estate or private equity investing. No matter what you do though, as an entrepreneur or a replicator, you should immediately start an LLC as LLCs are the quickest way to get away from the tax of a W-2 employee. You should learn as quickly as possible how to write off taxes. In fact, if you haven't seen it, go watch my video on what I learned reading 50 books on money, where I discuss this exact process. But with an LLC, 
you can use that as an exit strategy for your business by buying up other assets that are outside of your cash flow side of your coin. Again, there's cash flow side of the coin and the investing side of the coin. Okay, so I was gonna end this video with me burning down an entire tree, but the tree is still not cut up and it's been raining a lot and I just wanna get this video done and I don't have time because I'm super busy right now. So I'm gonna run through the last pieces of this video very quickly. The next video, you'll see an entire tree getting burnt down. But the next tip I have for you is when you start doing freelance work or become an entrepreneur and you're trying to provide service to a business, make sure that you fit into a business's systems depending on where your personality is. For example, I'm highly extroverted. I'm also very disorganized. This is the basics of what a business systems looks like. You have marketing and sales that goes into systems, which is like processing orders and fulfilling customer needs. Systems can be broken down into operations and further subcomponents of a business. And then you have customer satisfaction and re-engagement of customers as well as financial. Depending on your personality, you're going to fit into different places in a business more efficiently. For example, I'm highly extroverted and very disorganized, which means that I am not going to be good at operations or doing the day-to-day -day, uh, diligent tasks like I'm not gonna be that guy that's dotting the T's and crossing the I's. I am the guy that's gonna be on the front end of marketing and sales and talking to customers and bringing people in because that's what my personality works best for. The next thing you wanna do is as you join into a company or a business or an industry, pay attention to the major issues that most businesses are facing in that industry because that will give you great insight on how you can provide a service to solve that problem. Again, it comes down to what is a major problem that a lot of businesses have and the bigger the problem, the more money you will make from that on the cash flow side of the coin. The next tip I have is selecting the right industry. See, there's certain industries that are very old. In fact, I made a video called The Full Guide, What I've Learned Five Years of Investing in the Stock Market. And I basically go from like the 1700s up into modern day and show you like the macro cycles of economies and how they've shifted from the 1800s, where it was mostly railroad and steel to, and oil to consumerism, industrial revolution, manufacturing and consumer products. And then in the 1940s and 50s, it turned into technology, and then we're having a new wave of technology coming through. Anyways, I made an entire hour and a half long video to it. Go watch it. But you want to position yourself into an industry or business that is growing or has a lot of growth and a high cash flow. For example, utilities are a very slow and stable sector in the in the stock market that you can invest in, but there's no growth in utilities because that industry started over 100 years ago and there's no innovations or anything new happening there. So you wouldn't want to go into utilities to make a lot of money because it's just not a very lucrative industry to get into. The most lucrative industries, number one, by far, by a large margin is financial. So a lot of people find finance or the finance industry very boring, but it is vastly bigger than any other industry in America when it comes to like the amount of money that you can possibly make. The next up from that is technology, but it's much higher competition, much more stuff going on, and it moves much faster than the financial industry. Uh, so you're gonna have to be really on your toes when it comes to servicing or building a service inside of that industry. I would recommend pretty much anything that has to do with coding, artificial intelligence, or developing new stuff that is pushing innovation forward in the world is going to be very lucrative as far as providing services in that industry. The next tip I have is skill stacking. So back when I started in my family's manufacturing company at 15 years old, I started shooting YouTube videos. And I back then, if you weren't around, YouTube was basically like funny cat videos and memes. Their like, vlogs didn't even exist. But I knew that YouTube was an up and coming emerging technology that was going to be very useful and I knew video editing would be a very useful skill to have for the rest of my life. If you had asked me in 2008 when I first started shooting videos if I was going to be a YouTuber with 200,000 followers, I would have laughed at you. I would have had like, no, I'm, I just like making YouTube videos. But I did know that it was a skill that could be utilized for a very long time. So when you get into an industry or you're providing a service or getting into anything in business, Make sure that you're very strategic on the skills that you're developing and make sure that you can stack skills on top of each other. I started with video editing, then I got into writing and script writing and blog writing, which I knew writing was a, u a universal skill useful for videos, so that helped me with my video skills. Then I learned animations and graphics, which was also a complementary skill. Then I got into sales and marketing, which is also a complementary skill that can be stacked onto it. And then over the past couple of years, I've been coaching and mentoring, which has helped me understand my customers and the people 
people that I help better and I, so that I know what their problems are so that I can make better content for what I'm producing. So make sure that you are consciously thinking of the skills that you're developing through your 20s because they will stack and compound throughout the rest of your life. The next tip is a big one. I wish I had done this sooner is find a mentor. Find somebody who's already been doing what you're doing or brand new or just ahead of you and learn from them. Don't be that introverted person that's like, I can do everything myself because that was me. And it's a terrible way to try to get ahead in life. It is so much easier to find people that can mentor you and to show you like what you need to do rather than watching a thousand YouTube videos. Yes, you can do it that way. Yes, I have done it that way. That's how I pretty much all of my YouTube and video edit education was built on watching YouTube videos, but it would have saved me a thousand times more time and money and speed if I had just found somebody that was really good at it and then mentored and worked with them. So if you have absolutely no idea where to start or what you're doing, just find somebody who's doing what you're wanting to do and try to learn from them and try to provide value to them in, in, in exchange for the education and the mentorship. This is basically, I only do mentorship and or buying courses from people that I really trust and understand and know that they know what they're doing. Um, it's a waste of time to sit on YouTube videos and try to learn how to do something from scratch. It, you can do it, but it's just really inefficient. My next tip for you is always take the hard road and don't cheat at what you're doing. I, there's a lot of times, especially in business, where you will be presented an opportunity that seems so great and it's like that golden egg and it's that that golden ticket and it's like wow if I just do this I'll make a ton of money and yada 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 and you'll, you will rationalize everything you can about that decision my point that you should make or be aware of is pay attention to your emotions when you're making a decision in business especially if you're being sold something because scam artists and people that are selling stuff a lot of times they will play on your emotions to get you to buy something rather than it being an actual logical good decision that will be complementary to your business. And it's, it's always a terrible idea to develop a bad habit of cheating or getting one over on somebody in business because that is a behavior that you will develop and you will build a reputation of being untrustworthy and eventually that reputation will get so big that no one will do work with you. And also by cheating or taking the easy road and not the hard road, you are also robbing yourself of the opportunity to prove to yourself that you can do things and you can do things the hard way. When you take the hard road, it gives you confidence and it gives you more experience than doing the easy thing. It is human nature to always want to take the path of least resistance, but talk to any successful entrepreneur and they will tell you that business is not easy and you should always take the harder road or the hard decision versus the easy one because it will be net beneficial for you more in the long run than the easy road. Next tip is don't chase money, add value. This is very hard, this is very hard for me. When you're young, you're very about you and what you wanna do and all this stuff and I'm passionate about this. The world doesn't care and the world cares what kind of value you can bring to society. Okay, what can you do for me? And you actually see this a lot in sales jobs. Um, there's a thing in sales psychology called commission breath. And that is essentially like the sleazy car salesman vibe that you get from certain salespeople where- He's a real beauty, huh? Yep, a real beaut. This car is for you. Now, let me guess. The man of the house needs a second car so the little lady can go to the garden club while he plays gin rummy with the boys, huh? Oh, actually, we need a car so we can go rock climbing. Rock climbing? Why would anybody go climb a rock? You know, actually, we're, I think we're going to get going. Hey, come on, sweetie. No, don't be a bitch. Let's talk some numbers here. Yeah, if you've ever been approached by a salesperson and they're like trying to sell to you, like you can feel them like they don't care about helping you. They don't care about your problem. They don't care that it's going to provide a service for, for you. They just want the sale. They just want to make that money. Like just, bro, come on. Let me, let's, let's just get this through. This is going to help you. Yada, yada. That is a terrible mentality to take into business. And it's a terrible behavior to develop long-term. You should always approach every Everyone in business and everything you do, whether you're an entrepreneur, a freelancer, or you're even working a W-2 job, approach your boss, approach your manager, approach anybody that you're working with as how can I add value to you? How can I help you? The money will come. When people feel that emotional aspect of you wanting to des actually desire to help them, trust me, the money will come. You don't have to worry about the money. Don't chase the money. And my last tip for you is don't ever develop the habit of playing the victim, using excuses, making up excuses, or believing in luck. This is something that I really struggled with when I was a teenager working with my family. One day I screwed up and destroyed about $50,000 worth of parts uh, in a job. What? 
we, I was running a, a CNC machine and it was drilling and tapping holes. I ran it for about a week and I did like, it was actually paintball guns. If you've ever played uh, paintball, Tittman paintball guns, the, the outside metal casings are made by my family's company. We've been making them since the 1980s, but I screwed up the 632 tapped holes in the grip handle of the paintball gun and I let the machine run for like a week straight. And it was, <laughs> it was like 12,000 paintball guns. It was terrible. When my father approached me and called me out and said like, hey, you, you F this up bad. I played the victim. I made excuses. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I didn't do that. It couldn't have been me. I don't know. My dad basically like ripped my head off and is like, I won't, I won't verbatim repeat what happened, but it was, it was rough. I got, I got checked real quickly. My ego got taken down to here and I'm like, okay. And then my repercussions or what I had to do to fix the situation is they stuck me in a corner of a powder coating facility, which if you don't know what powder coating is, uh, it's imagine a hundred foot long furnace that burns at 500 degrees in the middle of August in 100% humidity, 90 degrees outside. They stuck me in the corner of this building and I had to sit there and hand tap 632 holes for three weeks straight by hand, just drenched in sweat. It was, it was awful, but it taught me a valuable lesson that in business, there are no excuses. There are like, if you run a business, if you provide a service for somebody and you screw up or you don't deliver, it is on you. Even if you have an employee or multiple employees and they screwed up, your customer doesn't care. The person that you're working with does not care. They trusted you and now you have not delivered to them. And if you play the victim and you try to make excuses or tell the customer that it wasn't your fault, all that tells the customer is that they can't trust you and they can't do business with you because you're not gonna take accountability for your screw ups. So do not ever play the victim or make excuses for your, even in life in general. like. Nobody's gonna save you in life. Nobody's gonna make your life better. Nobody's gonna help you. You are the only person that's responsible for your life. And 10 years from now, the decisions that you make now will play out and you will be where you're at 10 years from now. And I'm speaking from experience as somebody who screwed up my business and fucked up my life, basically. Nobody cares. And it's it, there's no point in letting your ego play the victim and feel like you've done something wrong. Like It's much quicker to just be like, I fucked up and I will make it right. Just say that. If you if you ever screw up in business, don't get upset about it. Don't get all defensive. Just, I screwed up, I'm gonna do better. I'm sorry, and I will make this right. Just say that, and that will take you a million miles when it comes to doing business with people. And lastly, don't believe in luck. Anybody that's successful, you can argue that there's an aspect of luck, but you should not believe in luck when it comes to business because it robs you of the opportunity to develop yourself. And it, and it makes you convince yourself that this person's lucky and this person made a bunch of money just because of this external thing. The reality is that person probably worked crazy hard to get where they're at. There, nobody, unless they win the lottery, and the, the lottery is like the one exception. If you buy a gambling ticket and you happen to hit big, that's the only time luck is real luck. And even then it's kind of argued that it's not, but long story short, don't play the victim. Don't make excuses in business and don't believe in luck. Work hard, take the hard road. Always provide help and service to the people that you're working with and good luck in business. If you have any questions on any of these things, hit the comments below. I know this is kind of weird me making a video about like how to be wealthy when you're not, when I'm currently not wealthy, but I've been there. I've been making $20,000 a year before. I hope this helps somebody. I hope you learn from my mistakes so that you don't repeat them because I'm a slow learner as I've learned. Uh, so I'm trying to learn faster now, but yeah, I hope this video helped you guys.